Welcome to episode two of PayingTheFirewalls.com podcast, a bi-weekly look at cybersecurity, including top products, the latest trends, news, expert tips, and interviews with top security industry company representatives. I'm Kevin Baxter, and I'm joined by my Firewalls.com colleague, Andrew Harmon. Hello there. Hey, Andrew. As we dive into a different featured topic each episode, new episodes of the podcast come out every other Wednesday, so subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform to get the latest one. And feel free to leave a comment or email us at podcast at firewalls.com with feedback or questions. And now on to our featured topic and our guest for this episode. Well, today's discussion topic isn't an exactly new technology. It's certainly the talk of the town in 2019. SD-WAN, or Software Defined Wide Area Networking, allows businesses to connect remote branch offices to data centers in order to securely deliver applications and services. And like so many other network security solutions, Fortinet is at the front of the pack, setting the pace for competitors behind them. SD-WAN options are definitely cheaper to deploy and easier to manage. But the question with network solutions is always the same. Is it secure? And to answer that question, we've invited Fortinet principal engineer Jaime Ortiz to discuss Fortinet's secure SD-WAN offerings. Jaime, thanks very much for joining us today. Hey, it's my pleasure, guys. And so before we get into specifics, can you give us a little bit of a primer on just what SD-WAN is for somebody who's not uh, fully familiar? You bet. So it's, it's basically a service or feature of the edge device that allows for dynamic routing of enterprise traffic across the hybrid WAN. And it's based on the current network status measured via configurable SLAs. And when I say hybrid WAN, I mean using circuits like commodity internet, 3G, 4G, and in some cases, even keeping your traditional MPLS. And is SD-WAN a good fit for organizations of any size? Oh, it sure is. So enterprise data centers, branch locations, even telecommuters can use it in their home office when paired to like another ISP or even 3G and 4G. It's a WAN technology that scales from the SMB enterprise HQ all the way to the cloud. So uh, as Andrew mentioned, SD-WAN has really come to prominence in the last year or two. But what are some of the concerns that people have when you hear folks talk about wide area networking? Well, as it pertains to secure SD-WAN, security and performance. So shifting the WAN to DIA or direct internet access with an overlay like uh, like VPN, it raises concerns that performance may not be on par with more expensive circuits such as MPLS. Also with the IA, customers are now looking for ways to implement security at the branch spot. At the branch, historically, they would backhaul the, the, data, the traffic to the data center where they could inspect the traffic before allowing it access to the internet. So with digital transformation in full tilt, direct access to the internet from branch locations is the foregone conclusion. So why would a modern business look to adopt to SD-WAN? So this goes hand in hand with digital transformation. Businesses today are leveraging cloud-based models such as data center migration, SaaS or software as a service, and infrastructure as a service to to name a few. With Secure SD-WAN, it's now possible to leverage commodity internet to route business traffic. Uh, Not only that, businesses can simplify the traditional WAN deployment model and significantly reduce time to deploy, which can translate into revenue. Uh, It also provides automation for failover as well as traffic and application steering to ensure the best possible quality of experience, or QOE. You've mentioned MPLS a couple of times already. Before we actually get into my next question, could you give a little primer on what MPLS is for people who may just be hearing about wide area networking to begin with? Yeah, sure. So MPLS is, well, I I guess we could go back in time, right, and look at how the WAN has progressed from, I want to date myself here, but from T1s and such, right, to where bandwidth was 
megabits, one and a half megabits, and then it progressed to eventually get us to MPLS, which was a native WAN technology that allowed interconnection of remote sites, offices, and it did it in a way that was seamless without having to be concerned with like media converters and doing that switch from traditional Ethernet to something else in order to transport your traffic. It also gives the ability to do native type functionality like VLAN and whatnot across the WAN as well. It's pretty ubiquitous and it's pretty much a staple anywhere that you go. And so we've mentioned this comparison, but how does using um, SD-WAN as your solution compare to uh, MPLS to connect? Yeah, so the short answer is uh, it costs less and it's faster to deploy. Uh, okay, I may be simplifying a little, but those are the those are the low hanging fruit. So Secure SD WAN is utilizing commodity internet for transport of traffic, and from what we're seeing, you know, the cost of a one gig pipe the internet is significantly less than the same size circuit over MPLS. All that being said, when a business wants to connect a branch to the corporate network, it can be as simple as sending a FortiGate to the remote office plugging in the internet circuits to the device and pushing the configuration from our Florida manager and you're off to the races. Install time can be minutes with full access to the corporate network as well as the internet and all of the cloud-based applications that are sanctioned. And not to mention, traffic steering and prioritization is part of the solution to ensure a great experience and to keep the help desk phones from lighting up with frustrated employees. Is there a particular reason why the solution is now growing in popularity? I'm going to say that it, it's really due to digital transformation. Direct Internet access has really become essential in order for businesses to thrive. A direct access to the cloud is a no-brainer, and since the Internet bandwidth is considerable these days, IT folks are buying into the value proposition of transporting corporate traffic over a cheaper 1 gig link instead of a 100 megabit link at a higher cost. I mean, all of us everywhere are being asked to do more with less, and Fortinet SD-WAN addresses this and then some. Also, since it's possible to bring in two or three or more different circuits from multiple carriers, you're now getting past diversity and can maximize your uptime based on applications and not just destination addresses. So this is really a game changer. Product-wise, Fortinet has come out with a couple of solutions this year that have really put the focus on SD-WAN and not just SD-WAN, but secure SD-WAN. So can you go over a couple of those solutions a little bit more specifically that Fortinet offers? Fortinet has been really ahead of the game in this, right? And so we we kind of have this one in the bag, right? We've built in security into our 48 devices that has been proven by NSS Labs, Gartner, VB100, you name it. We didn't have to add security to SD-WAN. We added SD-WAN to security. We saw this as a natural progression of the WAN, so we were ahead of the curve. The FortiGate Security WAN has industry-leading web filtering, IPS, AV scanning, real-time botnet detection, automation around quarantining of endpoints, and you know, let's not forget about the security fabric. Also, an essential element to protecting your network, you've got to be able to decrypt SSL traffic, right? Without this, I mean, let's face it, you're sitting duck. Without being able to see the actual traffic that is going to and from the internet, and, and we're talking 80% of traffic is encrypted, you really, if you're not doing this, you really don't have security, you're just really rolling the dice and hoping for the best. So, obviously, security is the number one thing on people's mind when, when shopping for these, but how does Fortinet address also performance and cost issues? <laughs> When it comes to performance, Fortinet is, is really the leader in that area, right? We, we build our own chips in-house that are purpose-built for speed. For example, we have a new SOC 4 chip that just came out that can be found in our FortiGate 100F. Uh, it's the industry's first SD-WAN asset. Um, well, let's face it, right? No business sits in a meeting and says, uh, we think we have too much bandwidth, so let's dial it back, right? That, <laughs> Fortinet builds the FortiGate with performance as a requirement, second to security. Uh, as far as cost, we've always been known to provide incredible performance and security at a price that, frankly, makes businesses question why they're still buying separate routers and firewalls. Um, to give you an example, right, in, in one of the NSS, uh, recent NSS Labs tests, Fortinet came in at $5 per megabit for total cost of ownership over three years, where the next closest competitor was $44. Wow. Well, somewhat significant there. We talked about businesses looking at this as a solution, but another thing that uh, a business looks at is kind of a long-term investment. So, you know, if the business is changing in size and scope, how scalable is secure SD-WAN from Fortinet? 
Yeah, the only thing constant in this in this field is change, <laughs> and fortunately, Fortinet embraces it. Our security WAN solution can scale up to 256 different interfaces within the SD WAN configuration. Can't say that I've seen many customers that have 256 <laughs> different paths, but if you decided you need to scale that way, sure, we got you covered. So. Something worth mentioning, right, is that we actually have customers that have deployed and are managing thousands of devices from a single form of manager. So when we talk scale and manageability, we can handle it. So you mentioned earlier the Fortinet security fabric and the 100F, which is a really unique new product from you guys. How does SD-WAN integrate throughout the rest of the Fortinet portfolio with uh, switches, access points, and all the other solutions? Yeah, this is a biggie, right? So our, our SD branch solution addresses this on all fronts. I feel like the answer to this one is going to be like one of those matrix memes that you always see on the internet that says, what if I told you? <laughs> so uh, what if I told you that you could replace your router, firewall, SD-WAN, web security, switches, wireless controller, and APs with a single Forti gate and a Forti switch and have access to all those functions from a single pane of glass and centrally manage all of it across the enterprise? Fortinet has created a solution that provides for consolidation, ease of management, increased security, and reduced cost. Uh, regarding the security fabric, this is really what sets Fortinet apart from everyone else. Shared intel between the firewall endpoints, automation both at the local branch data center all the way into the cloud, as well as visibility all the way up to layer seven. Being able to automate quarantine of endpoints on both the wired and wireless network as well as dynamic signature creation for identified threats. And of course, sharing this information across the enterprise makes the fabric essential. And let's not forget, the Fortinet security fabric integrates with third parties as well. We see it as a win-win for the customer to be able to share the intel from many sources in order to make the right call during an event of interest. And so you just mentioned really how everything's kind of combined into one solution. Are there, are there really other options on the market that do this? You know, from a holistic viewpoint, no. Fortinet really has this kind of in the bag, especially on the networking side of the fence, right? Being able to attach a switch to a 40 gauge firewall it's really essential because what we're doing is we want to make sure we can see everything that's going on inside the, inside the network, whether it be locally at HQ or even at the branch. But the real win here is that everything is available and centrally managed in truly a single pane of glass. And I know we hear that phrase over and over. But really, when we look at it, we realize that when you are troubleshooting if a bad guy has got inside your network, you don't want to be hopping through three, four, five different interfaces and trying to correlate data. We believe that you've got to focus on what's happening, and the technology shouldn't be a point of complexity to hinder that type of operation. Now, you mentioned the single pane of glass management. There are a lot of companies out there, small businesses especially, that don't have huge, robust IT teams, or maybe their IT teams are busy enough as it is. So how difficult is this for an average organization to manage? Honestly, when I've done demos or, or POCs, I've had customers tell me that this can't be it, right? This is too easy. We've built a GUI that makes setup intuitive, but we also give you the option for setup via CLI for the console jockeys that feel more at home there. Uh, to simplify deployment, businesses can leverage for deploy and for manager. For deploy is our cloud-based automated provisioning tool. With the use of the Forta Manager, our central management platform, you can create templates and pre-configure policies that can be pushed out to the end devices to accelerate deployment. In fact, in one of the recent NSS Labs tests, they wanted to see how fast the site could be up and running, leveraging our automation. We were able to deploy 75 sites with an average time of around six and a half minutes per site. So we're, we're building a solution that we take as much complexity as we can out of it, but by the same token, we still give you the ability to get even more granular if that's called for. You mentioned already a little bit NSS labs. For those who follow the industry, it's pretty common knowledge that Fortinet performs pretty well on, uh, on third-party tests and uh, other benchmarking studies. So how has Fortinet Secure SD-WAN held up so far in those types of environments? 
Yeah, so we're well on our way to collecting our accolades. So far, we have two consecutive recommends from NSF Labs for the past two years. We are labeled as a challenger with the furthest in completeness of vision in Gartner's first ever magic quadrant for WAN Ed. So we're, we're really just getting started. SD WAN is pretty prevalent out there, and for somebody who has done some shopping, they see that other companies offer something in relation to SD WAN. What makes Fortinet different in the SD WAN space? This is probably the most popular question I get. Right, so, first, we build SD WAN into our security platform, not the other way around. Building an SD WAN product can be in addition to any portfolio and even for startups. But when you start looking at security, this is something that takes years of experience and, and does carry a pedigree with it. And we've nailed both. Just look at the NSF Lab report. Also, while businesses are looking for the easy button when it comes to SD WAN, the reality is sooner or later, the lack of support for advanced routing will become a challenge. We are, after all, talking about a WAN here. Fortinet supports easy SD WAN as well as advanced routing that allows seasoned network engineers to tune their WANs how they see fit. A grander control is essential, and you don't necessarily get that from other SD WAN products. And finally, cost. When you see other vendors' cost models based on bandwidth, I bet you're going to feel like you're negotiating with a carrier for circuit speeds all over again. Our cost model is simple and upfront. So where should people go to learn some more about Fortinet Secure SD WAN? So always check out our website at Fortinet.com. We have case studies, white papers, and even the ability for you to log into a FortiGate and see how our SD WAN operates. And you can kind of kick the tires and take a look at it. While you're there, take a look around at some of the other solutions and see how the security fabric can help protect your network as well. I may thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here on the podcast. You bet. It was my pleasure. To learn more about Fortinet Secure SD-WAN and how to get it for your network, you can also visit our blog at firewalls.com slash blog and search Fortinet SD-WAN. We have a couple articles there, and we'll also include some links in the description. Now it's time for our next regular segment, Headlines. In this week's edition, we discuss a few top news stories in the network security world and what they may mean to you. So headline number one, 29% of small businesses spend less than $1,000 on IT security annually. So according to a report from Untangle, the 2019 SMB IT security report, nearly a third of small businesses they surveyed spend less than $1,000 a year on IT security. Almost flies in the face of uh, another thing that we found in the report that 80% of those surveyed say IT security is a top priority. Yeah, and uh, that certainly is a big discrepancy. But before we look down on all the small businesses, it's sort of important to remember that they often struggle with things like budget and the type of IT expertise they can afford to bring in on their team. Right. Every small business is different in terms of uh, staffing and the budget that they have available in this way. And, and certainly there are ways to still prioritize IT security without spending too much. Yeah. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is perhaps the best way for small businesses to secure their networks is looking for very comprehensive and very simple solutions. Yeah, things that you don't have to spend too much time setting up or uh, monitoring uh, throughout the process. I mean, I think uh, going back to this budget number, almost more concerning to me is when you see the 80% of people who consider it a priority. It's not the ones who spend less than a thousand because they know at least how much they're spending. It was another chunk in uh, in this report that actually didn't know how much they spent. So, I mean, that's something, maybe it's just that they spend whatever they feel is necessary and they're not measuring it, but there's also the possibility that they don't know what they spent because it's not a priority at all. Yeah, and I think that reflects probably a cultural issue in that business. You should at least be measuring what you spend, not just on cybersecurity, but 
probably every aspect of your business. Right. There are some other chunks out of this uh, report. So we, we get to about a little more than half with those who spend less than 1000 and those who don't know. And then you have about 20% saying they spend less than 5000 10% less than 10000 and 16% say they spend more than 10000 So again, we don't have the complete definition based off of this report. So a small business, you know, theoretically it can be a couple of people, it can be 50 people, and there's all sorts of possibilities there. Yeah, and another metric that they were measuring with this survey is how many physical locations that these companies were operating out of. And the majority of businesses surveyed said that they had at least two to five physical locations. And that demonstrates that convenient and affordable remote access solutions are becoming increasingly necessary. That was a really interesting number. Not only the 40% with five locations, there were even another 12% that said they had more than 25 locations where their employees work from. So it could just be a lot of employees spread all over the place working in individually from home somewhere. Maybe they have another branch situation set up, but that remote access and you know, we're only on episode two, but we <laughs> talked about remote access already on episode one as well. And uh, I don't think we're going to stop talking about it because it's definitely something that is very prevalent these days. We are in the era of mobile workers. So that solution that you need to provide really, again, you have to have security on premises to make sure that your hub is all set up and, and well secured, but you also have have to have a good way to provide secure and well-performing access for the folks that aren't there. I think if the cybersecurity industry wants to really assist small businesses with their protection, uh, it's imperative for them to start looking for more affordable ways to do this. And SD-WAN is one great example of that goal being pursued. And that is something even in the uh, report that they mentioned about a quarter of those businesses either already have SD-WAN set up or are considering it as a solution. And certainly something that we find is cost effective. We just talked to uh, Jaime about the fact that it is something that you can deploy in an all-in-one solution with the uh, Fortinet's option there. And our engineers actually can help you get set up if you're not sure how to do it, but you've heard about SD-WAN and you think it really fits your business's needs. Our folks can help here too to get it all set up for you so that you don't need to spend a lot of time doing the research. Just know that if you want it, it can be done. Yeah, and a lot of these companies that are spending smaller dollar amounts can look to companies like Firewalls.com and managed security providers for sort of comprehensive and automated solutions. So Firewalls.com security as a service can be just as low as a couple thousand per year and provides basically all the necessary equipment, monitoring, reporting, and IT expertise really needed to fully secure a business network for a pretty good price point. Headline number two really kind of dovetails with headline number one. It's another report that surveyed small businesses. This one, 80% of small businesses experienced a cybersecurity incident in the past year. And that's according to the Better Security and Business Outcomes with Security Performance Management report by Forrester Consulting. That was a mouthful of a report there. <laughs> but 80% having some kind of a malware attack or other sort of cybersecurity incident just in the past year. That's that's somewhat startling. We mentioned this on our blog a lot, and a lot of other bloggers and articles will reference the same 60% statistics that 60% of small businesses that suffer a security breach are forced to close permanently afterwards. Yeah, just within a, a six-month period after suffering from the attack, it's it's a costly thing to have a security breach in your business. And, and what they really point out in this report is that the cost really comes to the customers of the business. 
Yeah, 54% reported that the customers were greatly or somewhat harmed by the incident. And so that suggests a data breach that maybe some personal information is exposed. It could just be names, emails, uh, addresses, but sometimes that gets even further into credit card numbers, social security numbers, depending on what kind of business you have. So, And that leads into one of the reasons why these businesses have to close after Afterwards, because customers then find out that this occurred and they're a little antsy about working yeah. with this. Hesitant to continue yeah. doing business, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially with so many big name breaches in the news over the last couple of years, customers are definitely becoming more aware that when they give their data to businesses, it does them it does expose them to risk. And so they're starting to figure cybersecurity into their own buying decisions as well. Mm-hmm. And going back to this particular survey, more than a third of those business leaders surveyed actually believe they've lost business due to maybe due to the breach or due to a perception that they don't care about cybersecurity. And not just losing customers, but 39% believe that they're having a hard time attracting new customers after an accident. So the threat of cybersecurity is definitely no longer just this sort of abstract specter haunting us, but it's having very real and very dire consequences that impact how businesses survive. Mm -hmm. And about 80% surveyed here also say that the demand for cybersecurity reporting has intensified. So not only do you have to say that you care about cybersecurity, but you really have to show your work. Mm -hmm. And one interesting aspect that this survey brought up was asking IT administrators, what was the biggest factor in convincing C-level executives to raise their cybersecurity budget? Showing your work is showing metrics, and a commitment to metrics is uh, dovetailing with an investment uh, at the same time. So you see 10% or greater increase in security budget year over year is more likely to occur with those companies that have implemented formal security performance metrics. And we talked about the customer's perception, but that perception also, you know, rolls into the boardroom as well. Anybody who's concerned with the well-being of the company. Yeah, it's one thing to walk into the boardroom and sort of spin a tale of the worst case scenario. But when you come armed with actual metrics that have been monitored on your network in the last year, that is a big driver of being able to argue that cybersecurity effectiveness should be increased. And so how do you get those metrics? If you're somebody who is one of the decision makers of a small business, then you know that this is something you need to do, uh, but how do you move forward? So really, there are a couple of ways. Really, you start with that, you know, making sure that you have the right network security appliances set up in place. So starting with simple as a a firewall with an active security services subscription from the manufacturer, that'll get you started. But there are ways to even go deeper than that. Yes. So we here at firewalls.com with our managed security service include quarterly reviews of your network security health. And it provides you with very real actionable measurements and recommendations to improve your security effectiveness Uh, for non-managed customers. We also sell firewall health checks as a standalone service. So we definitely encourage you to find someone that can measure the metrics of your network security and start implementing those measures to increase your efficiency. Yeah. So when you're shopping for security solutions, you want to have that visibility and the reporting as a a big key part of, of, of your entire network security setup, not just making sure that you're secure, but making sure you know what's coming in, what's going out. And when something does happen, transparency can potentially help you perception wise as well. If, if there is a breach or if there's a threat and you're forthright about it right away, you're more likely to get a little bit more rope and leeway from customers and from uh, others in the business. We've definitely learned that trying to sweep the, uh, the problem under the rug does not work out. Uh, another really interesting tool can be found with Fortinet Cyber Threat Assessment 
Assessment Program, or CTAP. Basically, this lets you take a physical FortiGate firewall, attach it to your network, and leave it there for about a week where it monitors the traffic and internet usage of your business. And afterwards, you mail this back to Fortinet, where their threat intelligence team analyzes uh, what happened, what kind of threats were, were found and avoided, and where you stand so that you can make some more actionable decisions based on real information measured on your network. It's all about getting that real information, having the data to back up your decisions. I mean, that's something not just in the cybersecurity world, but you should really be thinking about that for any of your decisions as a business moving forward. And on to headline number three. This one is a little bit more of a think piece, I guess you could say. 11 Cybersecurity Lessons Colleges Should Be Teaching. It's a piece by Josephine Wolf for Slate, and she focuses on cybersecurity training as she routinely helps others complete mandatory training modules for a variety of institutions. And it's, it's kind of broken up into a couple of parts, this piece. The first focuses on the shortcomings of some of the existing trainings that are out there. And then uh, she provides some recommendations, points that she really deems necessary for individuals to learn when it comes to cybersecurity, which doesn't just apply to college campuses, it applies in general. Yeah, to any business or public sector, even home users should probably take these lessons to heart. And so we talked in episode one about employees potentially being one of the greatest cyber threats to businesses. Really, you think about it with colleges, you have a broader spectrum of those types of threats because you have your, you know, your typical administrative staff that any business really has. And you have faculty who are in a little bit different category than administrative staff. They play by a little bit different set of rules, but they still have .edu accounts and uh, log into your system. And then, of course, you have the students, and the students can be freshmen coming right out of high school. Maybe they've never had a business uh, account before of any kind, so they might not be thinking holistically about the ramifications of, of their actions as well. So, so colleges are kind of unique in that they have all of those different areas to uh, cover in terms of, of their training. Yeah, and it's it's a great thing that they do consider this sort of training necessary enough that most you know, students, faculty, everybody will go through some sort of cybersecurity training. But I think this article really focuses on the questions of is it enough and is it the most effective way to go about communicating that? One of the trainings that she pointed out had uh, had eight questions and... One of those was a multiple choice question asking to identify something that was not a reason for the individuals to understand why cybersecurity is important. So first of all, that question may be a little bit flawed to begin with. The answer, hmm, I don't know how helpful that one was either. <laughs> uh, the answer was attackers love it when potential victims understand how to defend themselves. So... Obviously, that's not a reason why cybersecurity. It's a pretty is tricky important. question just to get your head around. <laughs> <laughs> but do you really learn anything from that question as well? Mm -hmm. Another one of the questions mentioned was, what is the best metaphor for a firewall if a firewall were a person? Yeah, <laughs> that's a thinker. Yes. Um, and, and the answer was the person in the office who follows the rules and procedures basically by the books. Yeah, and strictly enforces those. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's nice to be thinking along those lines. But if you only have a you know, 10 or 15 minute training or 10 or 15 minute quiz for somebody to take, I don't know how much that's going to stick. Yeah, and that highlights the issue that cybersecurity concepts are pretty complex and we need ways to relate those complicated topics to the layman. And are metaphors like that really most useful for the average user in understanding how a firewall works? And I think that's you're on the right track when you're doing a plain language kind of translation for somebody, but 
as a practical exercise for somebody who is, you know, somebody who's just getting into the network for the first time as a student, as a faculty member, regardless, they don't even really need to be able to identify exactly what a firewall is. Really, you need to focus on the behaviors that they need to take to keep your organization's network secure. Yeah, and, and you have to ask, instead of just telling people, hey, you should use a VPN, you should encrypt your, your disk and back up your files, would it be more useful to sort of expand that training to actually show them how to use a VPN, how to enable disk encryption, and really beefing these courses up to more than, you know, little half hour or one hour snippets? Yeah, there are barriers really to use. So if somebody doesn't know or is not 100% sure how to use VPN, for instance, when they're at home, then maybe they just say, well, we'll skip that. Let's just sign into webmail and go from there. So yes, you need to make sure that not only do they know what the best behaviors are, but they know how to behave that way and feel comfortable doing it so that there's no kind of barrier to the correct behavior. Let's go ahead and recap some of those 11 lessons. A couple of those you mentioned using VPN when you're off campus, enabling disk encryption on your computer. Two-factor authentication, something that Wolf here does point out that a lot of institutions have already implemented, but you want to make sure that the folks have buy-in there too, and they really embrace that. Yeah, and two-factor authentication proves itself over and over in being one of the simplest and most effective cybersecurity safeguards around. Uh, Microsoft claims that more than 99% of attempted account compromises are foiled by two-factor authentication. Yeah, anything that makes it harder for hackers to get your credentials and get in is, is a positive thing. Another kind of suite of tips here that Wolf has, watching out for social engineering attacks. So that means watching out for password requests. Don't click on links in your emails or suspicious attachments in your emails. That's kind of all email behavior that can lead to a data breach. And I think one of the biggest takeaways she mentioned is just if you're not sure, ask somebody. You know, if you get an email you're suspicious about or you see a URL you're not too sure about, Google it. Go to the IT department in person or by phone and do a little due diligence and it goes a long way. Yep, if you get something that looks like it's official from the school, for instance, or, um, you know, in other facets of life from your bank, something like that, there's always a potential that it's a legitimate email, but you want to look very carefully. Maybe there's a typo in there, a letter switch that takes you to a different website. Maybe they give you a phony phone number. Really, you want to confirm by either reaching out, you know, if it's your credit card, then call the number on the back of your card, go to your credit card's website separately yourself and see if whatever is in here is actually a, a request from them or or if it's a, a phishing attack. I think that that double or triple checking is really, really a key. And one final bit that Wolf mentioned was a, a particular scam that seems like it would be fairly obvious not to participate in, but <laughs> uh, it apparently did work for some people. Yes, and I believe that was request for gift cards via email. So if your boss sends you an email asking for a $1,500 iTunes gift card, you might want to follow up on that in person. Yeah, apparently some of these emails would go out saying that there was some sort of an urgent need for a gift card in particular. I don't know if somebody was outside McDonald's and uh, <laughs> they needed to get a few Big Macs or what, but I guess the danger in this gift gift card attack is the untraceability after the fact. If you send an e-gift card code to somebody, then they just use the, the code, they've gotten your money, and there's not really much recourse. The particular type of attack was spread around throughout an organization, so there was no you know specific target. It wasn't just going for the finance department, for instance. So anybody out of an entire group of employees gets this email. All you need is a couple <laughs> to 
<laughs> feel like they need to send you one. Yeah, so listeners might be sort of scratching their head wondering who would actually fall for this, but uh, the idea behind the gift card scam is to shoot for a high number of targets rather than a very high efficiency rate. So if you send out a million of these emails and only get a few, well, you're still making money. And so that wraps up uh, this week's edition of Headlines. Time to move on to the Engineer's Minute. At Firewalls.com, we're fortunate to have a team of certified network engineers who offer a variety of services for top security brands like firewall configurations, endpoint deployment, and expert support, to name a few. In our Engineer's Minute, one of our experts will take a moment each episode to provide a tip or answer a question, and that's where you come in. Leave a question in the comments or email us at podcast at firewalls.com, and you may just get your question answered in a future episode. And so on this week's edition, we've been talking about SD-WAN, and here is Matt McLaughlin, one of our engineers, going over just a few of the ways SD-WAN can help business networks. We we as an MSP are seeing customers are becoming more curious of SD-WAN and wondering how this feature can benefit their businesses. In most cases, we feel SD-WAN can reduce cost, better performance, and better reliability without the need for upgraded hardware on the existing next-gen firewall. A lot of these new features simply become available as part of the latest firmware upgrades. I'm going to touch on how our customers can see benefits of this technology. We are seeing a lot of vendors using cloud-based applications, taking the application awareness of app control and turning that into application prioritization across multiple bank connections, which allows the firewall to choose the best path based on given SLA such as latency, jitter, or packet loss. This allows for better availability of crucial business applications and functions. Current technology has a limit on the capabilities of load balancing and routed path selection on basic failover. The load balancing intelligent failover features of SD-WAN allows the firewall to route traffic across a variety of WAN, MPLS, and VPN tunnel connections to increase availability of your business based on defined performance probes. These routes can automatically be enabled or disabled once certain conditions have been met. With the decreasing cost of DIA circuits and the overhead of backhaul and internet traffic through HQ location via MPLS, we're seeing a trend in deploying branch office firewalls with the use of cloud-based management tools. With zero-touch deployment, once a firewall is plugged in and brought online, you can push configuration over the wire, giving you access to push access control and security policies from one central location. To learn more about what our network engineers can do for your business, give us a call at 866-403-5305 or go to firewalls.com slash services. And thanks for joining us on this episode of Ping, the Firewalls.com podcast. Subscribe now to ensure you get the latest episodes as soon as they're available on whatever podcast platform you prefer. And please do rate and review us wherever you listen to the podcast. Visit Firewalls.com for all your network security needs and give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. For Andrew Harmon, I'm Kevin Baxter. We'll be back soon with another episode. But in the meantime, we remind you to get, get secure, secure, stay, stay secure. secure.